And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Paul Anthony Wallace, researcher, international best-selling author, whose books probe the world's ancestral narratives for their insight into human origins, human potential, and our place in the cosmos. Paul served for 33 years as church doctor, theological educator, and archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Paul, welcome back. It's great to see you again. G'day, Jeff. It's great to be with you again. So you were in the church for 33 years. How do your former church colleagues relate to you now that you're writing about ancient aliens? Well, I get quite a spectrum of reactions, to be honest, Jeff. I'm very thankful that I have uh, a few cl close colleagues who've made this journey with me, who've read all my books, who understand exactly where I'm coming from. The majority of my former colleagues have gone a little bit quiet in their um, contact and conversations with me because it is a taboo topic to talk about a populated cosmos, ETs in the Bible. It's not mainstream conversation in the churches and has been a real taboo for centuries and centuries. Ten years ago, the taboo was sort of broken by the Roman Catholic Church venturing a conversation on the topic, but the wider church really hasn't caught up with that. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm very motivated in writing on this topic is that I know that at senior academic levels, theologians know the credibility of what I'm saying when I talk about ETs in the Bible, but most people in the churches have no idea that that's what academic theologians think, have no idea even what their pastor might have learned at, at seminary, and we have to democratize this information a little bit, and so that's part of what gives me my uh, uh, the fire in my belly. Well, your new book is called The Eden Conspiracy, Ancient Memories of E.T. Contact and the Bible Before God. What do you mean by before God? Well, we think of the Bible as God's book and a book all about God. And by God, if I use that word, many of us were thinking of a transcendent being, uh, the creative source of the cosmos. And if I say to you that in the bulk of the Bible, in the Hebrew scriptures, there's not even a word for that. That would surprise a lot of people. Uh, so if you then say, well, what is the Bible about? I will say it's about a whole range of entities with whom our ancestors interacted in the deep past. And they have these very interesting and intriguing names, Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai, Yahweh. Who are they? They get translated uh, in a way that makes us think they're all God stories. Elohim gets translated as God. El Elyon gets translated as uh, the Almighty or the Most High. El Shaddai gets translated as the Almighty God. And in my books, the Eden series, I show that these are not real translations, and that when you go to the root meanings of these words, you're finding stories about the powerful ones, the stories of the powerful one more powerful than the others. You're finding the stories of the powerful one, the destroyer. And if you put those root meanings back into the texts, you will begin to recognize the shape of the stories. You'll begin to evaluate morally what's going on in them. And you'll quickly, quickly realize that what you're looking at is stories of colonization, exploitation, and governance by non-human entities, experiences that were quite traumatic for our ancestors, and then other experiences that were far more positive, beings who came and nurtured our ancestors in the deep past, enabled us to make the great leap forward into agriculture. But somewhere along the line, all these stories have been translated and redacted to give the impression that they are all stories about God from start to finish, and in my latest book, The Eden Conspiracy, I show how the narrative was changed, how, it, how Judaism began as a canon of stories about ancient ET contact, what we call paleo contact, and then how it was changed to become a canon of stories teaching monotheism, worship, 
and obedience to law. And that shift is traced with incredible openness and honesty in the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. Earlier in your career, you must have been dedicated to the Bible, if that's the right way to see it. And, you know, you took the Bible as most people see it. What was that pivotal moment in your life where you started going into this other direction? Well, I, it would be a number of moments, really. And you're right. When I became a Christian at the age of 17, I was encouraged to read the Bible in what we could call a fundamentalist kind of way, where you just take it all at face value, as if you're reading diary entries or journalistic reportage. And after a while of reading the Bible, you realize that can't be quite the right way of reading it. Um, if you take all the stories at face value, then God would appear to be a, a horrific uh, character, a really brutal character. And in fact, one of the early church fathers, Origen, said that if you take everything at face value, you'd have to believe of God, quote, such things as you would not believe of the most savage and unjust of men, unquote. So from the beginning, I was thinking there's something else going on here. When you go to seminary or theological college, you start learning Hebrew and Greek, and you get into the layers of the text and realize there are some stories here that don't seem to find their way into a lot of sermons. But the thing that really accelerated my learning was when I took on the role of a theological educator, where I was training other pastors. And I trained them in the history of Christian thought and in hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the principles of interpretation. How do you get from the text what the writer intended, and then how do you handle that? And so we would look at tools like source analysis, which says, is this the original form of the text, or has it come from somewhere else and been adapted? And if it differs from the original, how and why does it differ? You do form analysis. What kind of literature is this? How do we work that out? And how do we let that guide us in what we take from the text? And then another tool would be the very basic one, what do the words mean? And these were the kinds of tools I was training pastors in. And when I started applying them to anomalies in the stories we tell from the Bible, I began realizing there was a whole other story in the Bible hidden in plain sight. So it wasn't a single moment. It really was a progression of following up questions in the text with these tools and bit by bit realizing there's something else going on here. You entered the church, as you just mentioned, at 17. I would think that most people or most pastors have probably been raised with Christianity since birth. And if that's, or close to it, if that's true, do you think that those pastors are not willing or even afraid to go outside of the box like you did because it's kind of like they've been indoctrinated with that their whole life? Oh, you wouldn't believe it, Jeff. Every week I hear from people, they contact me for personal coaching, and a proportion of those people every week are the children of pastors. And they will have grown up being taught Christianity from the very beginning, but they will begin to see um, things that don't make sense in the text themselves and then in perhaps daddy's preaching. And depending on what kind of church it is, they might have no opportunity to really challenge daddy on his thinking. How did you get to that conclusion from that text? Doesn't that text suggest something else? In some churches, you're really not allowed to challenge the narrative because holiness is measured by being able to repeat the script. And I hear from pastors' children who are in their 70s and 80s who are finally finding their voice and saying, I always saw this, I've always thought this, I've just read your book, and it's affirmed me in the things that I've held personally for decades. But because they grew up with uh, a pastor, a, a father who was a pastor, they had never had the liberty to express themselves 
maybe when they moved away from home. But then there comes a point when uh, mummy and daddy are old and frail and you don't want to upset them. So, you know, the power over people to stick to the script is can be overwhelming. But then there are others whose experience is very different. And I'm delighted to hear from pastors' kids who say, my dad always preached this, but I always had the freedom to ask him and to challenge him. And my dad would always say, those are excellent questions. You should stick with those questions. And then I hear from others, particularly junior pastors, who tell me, I've seen what you've seen in the text. I know there's other stuff going on there. I know that's not really a God story. But if I say that, I could lose my job. And a lot of people find themselves in that situation. If you've got a church that is based on a doctrinal basis, the moment you question the doctrinal basis, your bona fides to remain in your position are in question. And it's a huge pressure of groupthink from the congregation to the pastors that I think has really slowed a lot of conversation and theological progress down. I think if you spoke with many pastors, they would say or all agree that there are contradictions within the text, and they know that and were probably even taught that, but they still just have to go on faith. Or they can't say it in their church because of the reaction they would get. And every pastor has to make a a calculation. And I say this because I really don't want to be judgy about uh, pastors and how they handle these problems. Every pastor, if they are teaching, has to calculate how far can I stretch people's thinking before my teaching relationship breaks. Uh, Every teacher is trying to develop the thought life of of their congregation, of their hearers. And different congregations will have different elasticity. And some pastors have far more freedom to say, look at this text, work out what you think is going on in it. Uh, And some just will have no wiggle room at all. And that's not down to their integrity. It's down to the dynamics of that community. Well, to get back to conclusions, how did you conclude The Old Testament was not about obeying God, but it was about ET contact with our ancestors. Well, when I started on this journey, when I was on the research path for escaping from Eden, what I thought I was going to find was the familiar Bible, but with some ETs in it, because I'd seen enough to realize that there are entities in the texts that There's the language of the day, and then there's our language today. And our language today would describe them as ETs. I'd picked that up. I had taken up the challenge thrown down by the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences back in 2009 when Pope Benedict XVI convened this colloquium to discuss the implications of contact with other civilizations. And his theologians, his spokespeople, really threw down a challenge by saying we shouldn't be surprised if we experience ET contact because we can find that in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so I thought I've got to respond to that. I've got to find out, are there aliens in the Bible? And if so, how many? So I started on my research path. I thought I'd find a few. I realized that the word Elohim, for instance, doesn't mean God, as we often translate it, it means the powerful ones. So maybe the Elohim stories are ET stories. But what I found was overwhelming that I could almost say the whole of the Hebrew canon is about paleo contact. It's all about the experience of our ancestors being governed by non human entities and being caught in the crossfire between ET demographics warring with each other over Project Earth. And so you've got the powerful ones. You've got the ones like the powerful ones. You've got the powerful one who's in charge. You've got the powerful one, the destroyer. You've got Dagon. You've got Asherah. You've got the Hachiah, the life form that abducts Ezekiel and speaks with him and then dispatches other life forms to ethnically cleanse a whole district using advanced technology. It's inescapable. 
it's inescapable that you're looking at stories about contact, colonization, uh, covert government with an ET layer in the governance of humanity all around the planet. And so I came away after researching this feeling that the Bible was essentially about that experience. The idea of God is in there, but God is not an active character uh, from start to finish of the Hebrew canon. The active characters are flesh and blood uh, entities like you and me, but some of them are from other planets. And then there are some energy-based beings in there, or archonic beings, as we might call them. And so once you've seen that, you can't go back to reading the Bible the old way, as if it's all about God. And in the most recent book, The Eden Conspiracy, I show how the choice was made to try and airbrush out the paleocontact aspect, to make it look like a story about God, to make it look like the whole thing is there to teach worship and obedience to law. But once you've seen the paleocontact in it, you realize the stories are about something else. They're teaching emotional intelligence. They're teaching us about social progress. They're teaching us about the dangers of covert government, the dangers of hidden hands in our economic and political life. And what appears is an incredibly rich education bequeathed to us by our ancestors who simply want us to have a better human experience than they did. In doing your work, did you take the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and translate it directly from Hebrew into English? And if not, how did you break all that down? Sure. Well, when I study the Bible, I always study with interlinears, which are a wonderful resource. So an interlinear Bible often will have uh, two familiar translations on either side of the page. And then in the middle, you've got the actual Hebrew, along with any variants in the Hebrew text. And then underneath each Hebrew word, you will have the literal etymological rendering of that word. And then you read that alongside a lexicon. And perhaps the most authoritative lexicon that I've used is the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, which shows you every usage of that word along with its root meaning. So you really get an idea of what the original writers meant. And I do the same with the Greek, Greek interlinear for the New Testament, and for the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the one that is quoted by those who wrote for Jesus. So that gives you a pretty um, good uh, overview of what's happening in the text. And you can drill down into those individual words and their usage. And from time to time, you'll come across words that the translators have had to guess at because it's the only use of that word that could be found anywhere. And so one of the most interesting exercises is to go beyond debates about translation and to leave some of these key words untranslated and then watch how they behave. So there's a word, for instance, glory. What does glory mean? Well, in the churches of today, it's a very vague word and it sort of just means wow or the wow of God, the root meaning is a big, heavy thing. So you could reread the texts and insert the words big, heavy thing to see how the big, heavy thing behaves. But if you don't like that idea, if you think that's an interpretation, then leave it untranslated and look at what a kavod, that's the Hebrew word, does. How a kavod lands, how it launches the impact it has on the land, how far away you have to be when the cavod launches in order not to be killed by the blast, what it looks like from the inside, what the textures are, the metallic texture, the glass-like texture, the feeling of the engine when it's on, the sound of the engine when the thing is flying, all that is described for us. And if you go at those texts and leave Kavod untranslated, you'll come away without any question in your mind. You're looking at spacefaring, flying technology. And that's how Ezekiel describes it, and that's how Moses describes it. And I think that's one of the most challenging uh, things I put in the Eden Conspiracy. I identify these key words, and I say, leave them untranslated, and then see what they do. See what the hachia, the life form, does. See what the Kali Mashatau, the disintegrator, does 
when it's used. And it's inescapable that you're looking at ancient technology used by ET visitors. And eyewitnesses have reported it. They've told us exactly what they've seen. And then generations of translators have struggled in how do they translate that because they think they're in a spiritual book describing spiritual phenomena. But when you get to these technological moments, that's when you can hear the translators really struggling to work out how do we express that. And with a 21st century eye, we look at these moments and say, I think I know exactly what's going on. We have words for that. It's pretty common for near-death experiencers to encounter an archangel on the other side. And it's my understanding that archangels are from the Old Testament. In your opinion, what are archangels? Well, there are angelic counters in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, what's intriguing about the language of angels is that it doesn't tell you what kind of entity you're looking at. The word angel is a functional word, so it tells you that this being is on a mission, on an assignment, or has a message. That's what the word angel means. But it doesn't tell you, is this entity human? Is it from Earth? Is it from somewhere specific in another region of space? And in the Eden Conspiracy, I point to hints that tell us regions of space where these visitors came from. And we find that the Pleiades uh, are named, Sirius is named, Orion is named. And so these beings that we call angels, I believe, were advanced visitors. So advanced species, what we would call ETs. And usually the language of angels is used when they turn up to help. And uh, this is one of the things I love about the Bible and the Bible's report of ET contact. Because today, if I say alien or ET, a lot of our minds will go to Mars attacks, invasion of the body snatchers, Independence Day. But there are tons of encounter experiences in the Bible that are positive. These angels come with messages to help or with physical assistance. And the same is true when we see the visits of entities by the name of Dagon or Asherah. They've come to help groups of human beings learn how to thrive on the planet's surface rather than just survive. And they teach farming and all the rudiments of um, medicine and sanitation and city building, so on and so forth. And so I think the angelic encounters, when we use that language, that's our ancestors saying we had visitors who were really helpful and they came exactly when we needed them. Can you tell us more about Asherah? Yes, absolutely. Asherah is a fascinating figure from the Hebrew scriptures because she appears to have been universally commemorated with affection. If you go to digs throughout uh, ancient Judea, throughout the Levant, one of the most common objects you will find as you dig up an ancient town or city is figurines of Asherah. And you'll recognize her because often these are handheld figurines used in festivals. And the figurines will emphasize the vulva, bare breasts, big bouffant hair. <laughs> and she is thanked for the harvest every year because she's the one who taught our ancestors how to turn naturally occurring plants into crops. She is the Hebrew version of stories you could hear all around the world. So you go into Mesoamerica, you'll hear the story of Hun Hunapu. Listen to the Zulu people, you'll hear the story of um, Babwana Warisa. Go to ancient Babylon and its stories of Oannes and the Apkalu. All around the world, stories of beings who came and taught our ancestors the basics of agronomy and city building. And what's fascinating about this is that why would you make a story like that up? Wouldn't you want a story that honors your noble ancestors instead of saying, we didn't know how to do this, somebody else showed us? And one of the most, I would say, extreme examples of this in terms of my worldview and assaulting my worldview was listening to the story of the Yongu people in Australia's Northern Territory. Now, the reason this was dramatic for me is that Australia 
has the longest continuous cultural presence known on planet Earth. That's the Aboriginal Australian presence, which goes back more than 60,000 years. And they have a very strong association with the land, and their expertise has always been living in balance with the land. And so when I hear the Yongu elders say there was a time when our ancestors didn't know how to live off the land. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to fish. They didn't know which plants were good to eat and which were good to avoid. But it was the Mimi beings who taught us these things. And the Mimi were not human. They were much taller than us. Their bodies were extremely thin and spindly, and they could appear and disappear on the wind. And you're thinking, what? They're saying there was a time when they were totally inexpert at living on the land. So this could be an arrival story from somewhere else, or it could be a great leap forward story that there was a time before we had this knowledge, before we were this clever, before we were this advanced. And the tutelage came from these other beings who were not human. So Asherah in the Bible is the Hebrew version of those memories, memories carried by almost every culture in the world, commemorated fondly with affection. And in fact, in the books of Jeremiah and Second Kings, the narrator uh, tells the reader that on every high hill and under every green tree, in every place they lived, Asherah was commemorated fondly. And at the same time, he said, the tribes of Israel did not worship Yahweh, which is shock horror because we think that's the holy name for God. But they commemorated other beings. And then those two writers also tell us that the kings of the day decided to get rid of all the installations to these other beings remembered positively and start paring Judaism down until there's only one advanced being remembered, and that's the Yahweh character. And they wanted that because they wanted to centralize um, power, centralize wealth. They wanted one God, one king, one high priest, one temple, instead of a network of temples, a network of priestly families, and a network of powerful entities remembered by their people. Sounds like they wanted a one world government. Well, certainly the, the goal was an easily governed people. They wanted an easily managed theocratic society. And the kings, Hezekiah and Josiah, felt they could achieve that if they ordered the life of the nation around the uh, worship of Yahweh and obedience to his laws. And yes, I think it was about controlling the narrative so that people could be managed, but also a tremendous centralization of wealth because it meant that all the ties of the people, instead of being spread throughout the kingdom, they would all come to HQ. They would all come to Jerusalem. So I think it was an exercise in management. In your new book, you talk about how Yahweh is the Jewish name for God, but not for Catholics. Can you expand on that for a little bit? Yes. Well, one of the things that uh, can be very puzzling is to realize that the name Yahweh is used in a variety of ways in the Bible. So uh, by the end of the Hebrew canon, when writers want to invoke the idea of a transcendent God, uh, creator of the cosmos, they will use the name Yahweh. But in the beginning, it's quite clear that Yahweh was one of many powerful beings, and he was actually quite a junior member of the Seva Hashemayim, the sky armies. So that's his role in the Hebrew canon. He starts off as this junior powerful one, and the name ends up being used for uh, a transcendent god. Well, a few years ago, the Pope of the day, and I'm pretty sure this was still in the time of Benedict XVI, sent an encyclical around the Catholic churches saying, please don't use the name Yahweh in our prayers and liturgies, because it is not a Christian name for God. Now, this was an incredibly telling thing to say, because Christianity has traveled for nearly 2,000 years with the idea that the Old Testament and the New Testament kind of teach about the same God. 
And so if Yahweh is the name for God in the Old Testament, then it must be a name for the New Testament God as well. And here is Pope Benedict XVI, the most conservative pope in my lifetime, saying, no, Yahweh is not a name for God as we understand God. And that should have sent people on a uh, hunt through the scriptures to work out who Yahweh really is. And I shine a light on that very question in the Eden Conspiracy. And I show that this name that has become revered as the holy name for God has actually been layered over other stories, stories about colonization, stories that other cultures have told as dragon stories. And when we start reading some of the early Yahweh stories through the dragon lens, we realize the stories are the same shape as the Chinese, Welsh, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Mesoamerican stories of dragons. And to clarify what a dragon story is, it's a story of social progress. It's a story of human beings maturing to the point where they no longer need to be governed by non-human entities. They find their own power. They find each other. And they realize that if they organize, they can manage and govern themselves. Thank you very much. And there's a story arc in the Bible exactly like that, where the tribes of Israel say to the Yahweh character, we don't want to be governed by you anymore. We want a human king. And that's the way things are going to work moving forward. And they get rid of Yahweh and they proceed with kings for the rest of the Bible. Now, if Yahweh was a name for a transcendent God, that moment of story doesn't make any sense at all. And that's why you do have to dig into the translation and say, well, what was the story originally about? And you realize this is a story about covert government because the Yahweh character disappears but continues to pull strings from behind closed doors, managing uh, the tribes of Israel's uh, foreign policy and making sure that things are still run along the lines that he wants. And in the Eden Conspiracy, I show that that's actually what's happened with monarchy in countries in modern times where we think we've gotten rid of monarchy. And then it turns out that even if you've replaced the king with a president or a prime minister, the old powers are very, very persistent. Our ancestors knew this and they told that story, but the lessons disappear when you read it as God's story rather than a story of paleo contact. Do you think that it's necessary that we have some type of leader or everything will go into chaos? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I remember, I'm old enough to remember <laughs> um, seminars in the 1990s aimed at uh, training managers or leadership development. And they used anarchy as a, uh, as a teaching modality. So what they would do is they would dump a group of people in a room and they say, here's your task. And what you find is that a group will very quickly specialize and they will very often appoint a chair to lead the group in this process. So when you say the word anarchy, most people think chaos, but anarchy and democracy are actually very closely related. And what they found in the 1990s is that it actually only takes minutes to go from anarchy to a form of democracy. And so do we need a leader? Well, the studies of the 1990s suggest, yes, you do need some kind of a leadership role, but it doesn't have to mean a leader in the, in the way we're used to thinking of as someone with all the power who then tells everyone else what to do. And that's sort of how the story starts. That's what a king is. A king has all the power and tells everyone what to do. And societies have done their best to move away from that, where we democratize that power, where we, um, where we spread it out, where we disperse it, where we have democratic accountability. Um, but you do still need enablers and leaders in one sense. But I think it's very interesting to reflect what we what our thoughts are about leadership because if people talk about strong leadership very often they're talking about leadership with no fellow feeling no listening skills no compassion no interest in the implications for others they'll just force what they want through and that's strong leadership and there's something in us that that 
admires that and venerates that. You know, very often we vote for despots because we vote for power in that kind of a way. Whereas if we hear a president or a prime minister saying, we're not going to make any decisions until we hear from everyone who's going to be affected by this, and until we find a solution which the great majority of us are happy to support and work with, when we hear that kind of language, we think, oh my goodness, how long is that going to take? That's weak leadership. Whereas it's actually far more skilled leadership to lead that way, and it makes better and longer-lasting decisions. I'm a great fan of um, a fellow from the 500s, St. Benedict of Nursia, and he is the guy at the beginning of the Benedictine movement, the planting of Benedictine monastic communities throughout Europe, which were absolutely vital in carrying the torch of civilization post the Roman Empire. And his model of leadership is wonderful. But it sounds like the weak model that I just described. And yet it's a model of leadership that has survived from the 500s to the present day. The Benedictine order is still healthy and flourishing because they unpacked how they wanted leadership to work. Our ancestors wanted us to have the same finesse in how we govern ourselves that we are not all under the power of a despot or a xenophobe or you know, some crazed individual who can just rabble rouse. They wanted us to be equipped for a much more subtle, nuanced, positive experience of life on earth under governance. And that's why they wrote these stories showing how a king operates or how, how an ET governs over human beings so that we can chart a better course. The word Eden is in all the titles of your book. What is it about the story of the Garden of Eden that kind of is a running theme through all your books? Well, there are a couple of reasons that I've used the word Eden. I'm very interested in human origins, where we came from, who we are, and therefore, what are we capable of? And so the word Eden immediately evokes that idea. It's the place of human beginnings. And so I use it for that reason, because all my books ultimately are about that. But I also use it because we have certain ideas about Eden. If I say the word Eden, you think about a paradise. You think about human beings living in this perfect garden with a perfect climate, so perfect they don't have to wear clothes, and all the food is just growing on the trees and they can pick their meals whenever they want. It's, it's an idyllic environment and none of the animals will eat them. And yet, you go back to the Eden story, just read it as it's translated right now, and you'll realize, oh, it wasn't a paradise. And then drill down into the root meanings, and you'll recognize that the Eden stories in the Bible are a retelling of the ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, and Assyrian stories. And they are stories about E.T. demographics fighting with one another over the development of Homo sapiens. We get developed, but we get abused in the process, and we get exploited in the process. And Eden turns out to be a place of experimentation, great leaps forward, but great pain and trauma as well. Traumas which are remembered by cultures all around the world. And so in my titles, there's always this dissonance. There's the Eden word, which sounds lovely, but we're escaping from Eden in the first one. We're suffering the scars of Eden in the second one. Echoes of Eden, well, that's a little bit more of a gentle title. And then the Eden conspiracy, again, well, something nefarious has happened relating to human origins. What's that? And so that's why I love the Eden word. It tells you what it's about, but it's also there to intrigue when you read it in the context of the whole title. Some of my guests talk about the Galactic Federation, and you write about Brigadier General of Israel Hayim Ashed, and he speaks about the Galactic Federation. Earlier, you mentioned the Sky Army. Do they talk about it as the Sky Army or the Sky Council in the Bible? Yes. So the Bible has two phrases for what Hayim Ashed calls the Galactic Federation. There's the El. Ba'adat, which is the Council of Powers. And then there's the, what I call the Sky Council, because that's how, it's, how it plays out in the drama of the stories. And then there's this other phrase that Seva Hashemaim, the Sky Armies. 
Now, in traditional Bibles, it's rendered as the heavenly host. But if I say the heavenly host, most of us will start thinking of Christmas carols or we'll picture, the, you know, angels singing hymns of praise or we'll picture the Sistine Chapel ceiling with these beautiful bodies draped in sheets there adoring the Almighty. The heavenly host. The root meaning is sky armies, airborne armies. And if I use those words, well, now you're more likely to picture advanced beings arriving from space with advanced tech and advanced weaponry. Look at the drama of the stories, and that's who showed up. Read Ezekiel, that's who showed up and ethnically cleansed that uh, whole district that he talks about. And so that is the Bible's language for a diversity of visitors. So the Tzavah HaShemayim, some are violent. But others, like Asherah and Dagon, are not violent. They are here to help and to assist. And they occupy this committee, this sky council, in some kind of an une uneasy truce, conflicting with one another over how Project Earth should progress, but maintaining some kind of an agreement. And that includes an agreement of non-disclosure for most of the time. They are very visible at the beginning of the biblical story. By the end, they're off planet. They're pulling strings from behind closed doors. And this is what Hayim Ashed was speaking about uh, in Christmas 2020 when he announced, and I should say who he was, because for 27 years, he was the brigadier general in charge of Israel's space security program. It was his job to know if we are in contact or not. And he said publicly that on the basis of his privileged information, his understanding is we have been in contact for a very long time. And that that contact is with the Galactic Federation, a great spectrum of non-human entities, space-faring civilizations who occupy this council discussing Project Earth, and also involving themselves in research projects, he says. And he doesn't go into detail as to what those are, but obviously the mind boggles when you hear that language. When Hayim Ashed said that, it was not surprising to anyone who had read um, world mythology or ancient ancestral narratives. He's just finding new language for what our ancestors have told us about for a long, long time. But what was shocking was the seniority of the person saying these things, that this is a person of phenomenal credibility who has absolutely nothing to gain by making an untrue statement. And yet here he is fronting the press saying, this is the world we live in, that the USA is in contact, Israel is in contract, contact, other world powers are in contact, but that it's a stable arrangement and that when you and I, the general public, come to a fuller understanding of what space is, then we might be let in on the secret. But he's just letting us know that this is going on. That's been one of the most intriguing things to me that he said is space is not what you think it is. Yes, that's right. He said, until we have a fuller understanding of what space is and what spaceships are, because space is not what we think it is. Do you have any idea of what it is? I'm guessing. but uh, And it crosses over with, with the topic of NDEs. Because a lot of people, when they experience NDEs, they have this experience in which time doesn't mean anything. Time means a great deal to us in this material life. We experience things in a, in a linear fashion. Our lives have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sometimes our lives seem to be happening very quickly, and sometimes things are really dragging on. As soon as you're out of the body, whether you're having an out-of-body experience because you've just flatlined in, in the operating theater, or you're having an NDE, a near-death experience, time doesn't mean anything anymore. Everything is happening all at once. And time is... Um, interwoven with space. This is uh, part of what Einstein demonstrated through his um, general theory of relativity. So if time 
is really a matter of everything is happening all at once, then maybe we're really all in one space. And maybe really there's no distance between us and the far reaches of space. Maybe that's why our visitors can ping into our material airspace just like that, because that's how it's reported, for instance, by the uh, USAF pilots who um, intercept, they were naval pilots who tried to intercept the Tic Tac craft back in 2004, these craft ping into our airspace. And so that phenomenon tells us straight away that space is not this linear, empty thing we think it is. We've learned that space is not empty, that it's made of something. But I think that sense of distance is an illusion in the same way that time is an illusion. I can only think he's hinting at that. But that's that's me joining the dots. That's not some privileged information that I have. It's fascinating that you say that because some near-death experiencers and some out-of-body travelers will say that the other side it's still right here. It's just in a different frequency, like changing the station yes. on a radio. Yes, that's right. And that language is there in ancient ancestral narratives. So if you listen to Aboriginal Australian story about the dreaming or dream time, when Europeans arrived in Australia and first started hearing these stories, they thought these were stories about the deep past. But then as they listened more carefully, they realized, no, this what they're talking about is a parallel dimension that occupies the same space as this, but is somehow out of phase so that we don't see it or hear it or feel it. And that way of thinking is exactly the same as the way the ancient Celts viewed the world. They spoke about something called the She, which is spelt Seetha, but it's pronounced She. And again, it was the idea that there are entities um, overlapping our space here, but we could use the language of resonating at a different frequency so that they're out of phase with us, so that we don't bump into each other, we don't see each other, we don't hear each other. And yet, in Celtic mystical modalities and in Aboriginal Australian ceremony, you can modulate your brain waves to the point where you begin seeing these other things and you begin hearing these other things and having contact experiences that will then affect our material experience in this dimension. And it's one of the things I touch on in the Eden Conspiracy, that that language of adjacent dimensions is there even in the Bible. And when you come across the word eternal or eternity, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, what you're really looking at is language of dimensionality. There's a word olam, which some Hebrew translators have rendered as worlds or universes. And if you ponder long enough, what we're doing when we put the word universe into the plural, we are talking about parallel dimensions. So I find it fascinating that we have language for it today and that you can go 60,000 years back and find that our ancestors had language for it too. I never really thought about this because I'm so far away from Australia, but even breaking down the word aboriginal is fascinating to me. Like ab, I would assume, is kind of like away from original. Well, to be honest, I've not probed how we came to use that word. But I do know that uh, many indigenous Australians um, today prefer to speak about original Australians, um, that they don't identify with the word Aboriginal. And it may be for the reasons that you've just said. And so um, I, it, it depends who I'm speaking with, but you, I want to be respectful to the people who were here 60,000 years ahead of me. If they prefer to be called original Australians, that's the language I'll use. But many do accept that word, Aboriginal Australians, as an assertion that they were here first and they were here for a very, very long time and with a wisdom tradition that is one of the oldest continuous traditions in the world, the oldest by current archaeological uh, information. Can you share with us some of the examples of ancient technology within the Bible? 
Yes, I think probably one of the most famous and fun examples is Ezekiel's experience of the kavod, uh, which he um, also calls the ruach. The word ruach is often translated as spirit in the Bible, and the word kavod is often translated as glory. But what Ezekiel describes is of a craft that appears through a hole in the sky, which is fascinating in itself, and then comes to the surface through a whirlwind wind. Well, if we picture that in our minds, we're thinking, that's a portal, isn't it? That's some kind of a wormhole we're looking at. It arrives and then later in the story, he is flown around in it. So he describes that when it lands, it shakes the ground. And it sounds like a, a rocket type craft. But when he travels around, he's traveling around in some kind of a small capsule. And he describes the rotors that propel it and the, the vibration that it creates when the engines are on and the sound, which is like the roar of a waterfall. Well, if you've heard a rocket launch, Yes, a roar of a waterfall, that is what it sounds like. He talks about the metallic textures, the glass texture of the canopy, and the experience of flying around. And he even has language for the G-forces when the thing takes off. He says, the hand of the Lord was heavy on me, and I felt sick. Yes, that's G-forces. So he's flown around in that, which is fascinating, because Moses has seen it from the outside. He's seen it launch and land vertically, SpaceX style. And then Ezekiel is then shown this weaponry, the Kali Mashatau, the Kali Mapasau. One is a, uh, a destroying thing. The other is a disintegrating thing. And six individuals can ethnically cleanse an entire district if they have a disintegrating thing in their hand, apparently. So you've got that technology there, which is all a bit worrying. And it relates to maintaining order in a colonized world. That's the context of the Ezekiel story. And then you go uh, elsewhere in the Hebrew scriptures, you'll come across these devices, the Urim and Thummim, which are communications devices. They're trying to get communication with powerful ones who are no longer accessible on the planet's surface. So they're using these devices, except it becomes clear that nobody knows how to work them. The priests don't really know how to work them, and the narrators don't know. So it's all very, very vague as to how they work and what they are. And the more you look at the description of them, the more you will think the Urim and Thummim are actually copies of something that they have seen used by other people. They've seen advanced technology, and they're trying to replicate it. But to make it work, they have to accompany it with shamanic protocols. Uh, they have to be in an environment that's absolutely saturated with cannabis oil so that as they inhale the fumes, they'll begin to have contact experiences. Well, if the Urim and Thummim were technology and worked on their own, you wouldn't need to do that. This is very similar to what we find in Mesoamerica, where we've got devices that look like Bluetooths being worn by the kings and queens, but they have to do a bloodletting, a near-death ceremony, in order to established remote communication. So a little clue that they're copying technology they've seen, but they can't make it work. So they have to have this shamanic protocol to do the contact thing. Very similar again to the Ark of the Covenant, that when the leader is seated adjacent to the Ark of the Covenant, he will get communication from afar, from Yahweh, who's now not on the planet's surface. So that when the leader is seated adjacent to the Ark of the Covenant, you believe what he says and you do what you're told because he's getting communication remotely from the powerful one. So those are all examples of technology where you can't really find your way to a non-technological explanation of what these items were. And yet the way the stories are told, I argue in the Eden Conspiracy, this is the technology of a previous civilization. These are actually facsimiles of pieces of technology that they had seen in operation and were trying to replicate, but they could only make them work through altered states of consciousness. It's the same in the Hebrew story, and it's the same in the Mayan story. And I would suggest it occurs in other cultures around the world.
Do you think it's possible that ETs were involved in the writing of the scriptures, both the Hebrew, Old Testament, and the New Testament, and possibly manipulated it or changed it in some way to confuse us? Well, I haven't found that, to be honest. I think the the changes uh, that I trace in the Eden Conspiracy are all human-driven. I think that there came a time when the uh, kings wanted to centralize power. Uh, and this is not an unusual thing. You could see governments all around the world doing this. They will find a moment of opportunity and they'll say, let's bring in some legislation that gives us a little bit more clout than we had before. This has happened in recent years in the USA and it's happened in recent years in Australia. Uh, King Hezekiah came along, and that's exactly what he wanted. He was a Yahwist. He worshipped Yahweh. Yahweh wasn't around. He wasn't on the planet's surface. But we had someone who wanted his religion to be the religion of his entire kingdom. He didn't want to be a Yahwist and then have citizens who followed Baal or Dagon or Asherah. He wanted his religion to apply to the whole nation. And the laws of Yahweh would explain why he had the divine right to rule. And so he was very interested in getting rid of the other priesthoods, the other temples, the standing stones that commemorated the place of contact uh, with um, advanced beings in the deep past. He was very happy to dismantle other priesthoods so that the ties would all come centrally. He's got a theocratic society now where he's controlling what people believe He's controlling their devotional practice. He is the mouthpiece for the one and only advanced being, Yahweh. His priesthood running the Jerusalem temple, they are the ones who tell you what's true, what's false, what's news, what's fake news. And so you can see why from a kingly perspective, he would want to do that. And if he believed that his God, Yahweh, was the true God, he would believe that cleanup was very devout and that he was saving his people from idolatry. And that's the beginning of the change. So there's a cleanup of devotional practice where the Asherah figurines are seized, the other altars are broken, the other temples are knocked down. And that reform continues over the next couple of generations. His grandson, Josiah, comes along, continues that process, and begins the process of collating the Hebrew scriptures, this vast library of scrolls, and giving them a uh, roundabout edit to turn them into a book legitimizing Yahwism, the monarchy, the high priesthood, and it becomes kind of the, the code book for this theocratic kingdom. That's the process, and it's all done for human reasons at a human level. They were worshippers of this other entity, but I don't think the other entity was hands-on in making these editorial changes. As far as my studies go, the putting together of the scriptures was by human writers and was a human exercise, albeit in the name of God. I was just thinking, is it possible that an ET could appear as a human and then, you know, have some kind of misinput or put in some things that, you know, would steer us in the wrong direction? Well, funnily enough, there are a number of occasions when visitors appear in the Bible and the experiences think it's a person. And it's only after the encounter that they think, hold on, that wasn't a human being. But almost all those stories are positive. Uh, they're not stories of somebody turning up and tricking them, pretending to be a human being and deceiving them. They're stories of help. They're stories of people who can't have a baby. Suddenly, they're pregnant. They're stories of people in a desperate military situation and suddenly they have been given rescue. Uh, and in those cases, at the beginning of the encounter, they're thinking this is just another person, who are you? But then bit by bit, as the encounter goes on, the being will identify himself, or sometimes it's literally after they've left that they're thinking, wait a minute, or it's, or it's months later when they realize the wife is pregnant that they think, wait a minute. But they're generally, that kind of story is generally a positive story in, in the biblical canon. If you don't mind, I would like to ask you a personal question. Feel free. 
Do you believe that God is a being separate from all of us and ETs that created everything? Or do you believe that all of us, including the ETs, collectively are God? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, let me answer it this way, that when I use the word God, uh, I only use it with reference to the source of the cosmos. And the Apostle Paul has a wonderful phrase for this because he finds himself one time in Athens and he has to define what he means by God to a non-religious audience. And so in Acts 17, you can read this. He says, by God, I mean the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, of which we are all offspring. So it's a much more cosmic vision of God. It's not God a person, God a being, God a puppet master, God a giant Father Christmas type figure. No, it's a much more cosmic vision. God the source of the cosmos and everything in it. And when Paul says that, he's is very close to Plato's idea of God. And I, I want to mention his idea because I find it really inspiring. If we put Plato and Einstein together, it's interesting. Einstein proved, I believe, with his general theory of relativity, that space, energy, matter, and time all had a beginning, and it was the same beginning. And what that means is that if you keep asking the question, what went before? What was the Earth like before it was like this? What was our solar system like before it was like this? What was the cosmos like before it was like this? You go far enough back in time, you'll reach a point where before doesn't mean before anymore, because time has a beginning. And Plato said, when you get to that point where before no longer means before, if you look around, you'll see a unified field of consciousness. And that is what exploded in the Big Bang. That's what fractalized to form the material universe. And the material universe is that primordial consciousness experiencing itself through a multiplicity of beings. So we're the plural, and God is the unity. God is the source. And it can sound very impersonal to talk about God that way until you unpack what Paul means when he says, in whom we all live and move and have our being, it means that my intelligence is a participation in source intelligence. My consciousness is an emanation of source consciousness. And so I can expect to think divine thoughts. I can expect to have divine experiences. And there's a sense of connection with the source and with one another that's incredibly intimate. There's intelligence in the source. There's awareness in the source. So it's not a lonely universe at all. It's one in which we are intimately connected with the source and with one another. And when I use the word God, that's what I mean. And I don't think we should use the word God to apply to anything else because it encourages us to think too highly of beings that are simply beings. When Jesus speaks about the kingdom of heaven, I think the quote, I'm not sure of the quote, I'm sure you'll know, but it, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of heaven within, is, yes. I'm assuming he's also speaking about connecting with the unified field. Well, yes, that's right. This is where, again, root meanings is really exciting because if you go to the Gospel of Thomas, which is, many scholars believe, the earliest gospel, or the Gospel of Matthew, which is the canonical gospel, uh, one of the four in the New Testament, you'll find Jesus saying, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Translate those words, the kingdom, the realm of heaven, with well, that space, that's the cosmos. The whole of the cosmic realm is inside you. And that is an incredible invitation. It says, if you look deep inside yourself, you are going to find the cosmos. And if you look deep into the cosmos, you're going to find yourself. And so there couldn't be a more profound invitation to explore than that. And at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, there's another kingdom saying, where he says, um, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
And our conventional translations, and we listen to that after 2,000 years of sort of Christian dogma, what we think he's saying is you better clean your life up because God's about to show up and you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. You go to the root meanings, he's saying something quite different. He's saying, go beyond the mind. That's the repent word. Go beyond the mind. Think with more than this. Go beyond the mind because the realm of the cosmos is available to you. The powers, principles, people of the cosmos are available to you. Again, it's an invitation to explore who you are, where you are living, and what help is at hand, and what is possible in the light of that. Because Jesus then goes on to show what's possible in the light of that. This incredible fearless living, this ability to alter the environment, this ability to affect entity removal, to affect healing, life transformation. This is what happens when we begin to play with the principles of the cosmos that are at work within us. So this language is really far-reaching. It's an amazing experience of exploration that Jesus invites us on. But the distortions of translation through centuries of Christianity have hidden, I think, the more exciting aspects of Jesus' teaching in that way. Are there places in the Bible that guide us on how to access those realms? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, I think one obvious tool is fasting. So very often when you see fasting used in the Bible, whether it's in the Hebrew Scriptures or the Gospels and New Testament, what follows that experience is remote communication or an encounter experience. And that matches what you'll find in other cultures. So if you go to Central or South America and you want to do a tea ceremony, um, which will lead you to a contact experience, you will be, if you're being guided properly and traditionally towards one of those ceremonies, you will have to fast for a week before you do that. And so this is really is quite a, a global piece of knowledge here that you can alter your diet to make you more amenable for remote communication and contact experiences. And it can work the other way around as well, that I find that when people get an appetite to connect more with their invisible team of helpers, very often by instinct, they will begin to eat a lighter diet. That somehow the two things go together and we feel it instinctually, but we see it in the scriptures as well, that you can make yourself more receptive more alert by altering what you eat and drink. So that's just one example. The other I gave earlier, which is of the, uh, the infusion of uh, cannabis oil, which became criminalized in the story of the Bible. Of course, we've criminalized it in modern history as well. Turns out it was criminalized simply as a way of controlling the, pe the peace movement and the civil rights movement. In the Bible, it was part of that controlling of the narrative that now only the priests were allowed to use the cannabosum oil and inhale it for their ceremonies. If a member of the public did it, well, you could be executed for that, if I remember correctly. What is the main takeaway that you want people to get from reading your new book? I think uh, I want to give people an appetite to go back to the Bible and realize it's about other things and really does have a very rich education for people. A lot of people avoid the Bible because they're not interested in religion, and they think the Bible's all about religion. And I found it's not about that. It's about paleo contact, our ancestors' experience of contact in the deep past, and it's about who we are and what we are capable of individually and as a society. And I hope that people will come away from the Eden conspiracy with a real appetite to discover what's possible for themselves and for their family, their community, their town, their city, their country, because our ancestors believe we can have a far better and more empowered experience than the one we've been having to date. So I hope it's with that kind of appetite that people will come away from the Eden Conspiracy. You touched on this earlier, and I also noticed this when I looked at your website 
that you are coaching now, is that something new that you're doing? And what are you coaching people for? Coaching is really something I've been doing for decades. But my Eden series has really redefined who comes to me for coaching. Some people come for the reasons, uh, just for the reasons of life, transitions of life. Uh, They've been promoted. um, There's a change in their living arrangement. They've got married. They've got divorced. Somebody's died. They've got ill. They're suddenly unemployed. Life can throw some curveballs at us, and sometimes it's helpful just to be able to share the experience with someone who's not in your immediate environment and just have uh, an ear, a shoulder, a hand to hold to guide you through a difficult transition. Some transitions are really exciting. You might suddenly be operating professionally at a level you've never operated at before, and very often people reach out for coaching for those reasons. But a great many people reach out to me because they've had encounter experiences. They've experienced a close encounter. They've experienced a uh, spiritual emergency or a spiritual emergence, as some people call it. And they're working out how to engage with that or, or how to continue with life when this whole other universe has opened up to them. Some people contact me because they've seen other things in their sacred texts whether it's Jewish texts, Christian texts, uh, other religious texts, and it's off the curriculum for their community of faith. They've seen things that they're not allowed to talk about in their church or their synagogue or in their family, and so they reach out to me. I hear from people who've had encounter experiences decades ago but have not had anyone to talk to about them because they don't want people to think they're crazy. And so they reach out to me because they need to process what's happened. And it's a very great privilege for me to have these conversations. Many of my clients are also veterans of war because that can be an incredibly dislocating experience. You come back to a world that you understand completely differently because of your experience in the theater of war. Or you may have seen things that have blown apart your worldview And it can be incredibly isolating. And it's my great privilege to talk with people who are processing that kind of life experience as well. But I coach people every week. It's my absolute pleasure and privilege. If people want to do coaching with me, they can find me through my website, which is paulanthonywallace.com. Anthony with an H, Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S.com, paulanthonywallace.com. You can find the coaching page and reach out to me through that. Paul, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Well, today is a significant day for me because I am mourning the passing of a great, and that's Tina Turner. Uh, Tina Turner has been an amazing inspiration to me uh, since I was very young, and uh, not just because I loved her performance style and her musical canon, but because Her solo career began when she was about 43 years old. And so for many of us, she's a great symbol of hope that we can all be late bloomers and that life is a long game and it's good to play the long game. And I applaud Tina Turner for having done that and been an inspiration for so many. And I think for me, she also shows the power of intention that um, morning by morning, you can choose what kind of energy you're going to put out into the world, what energy you will give others when you interact with them, uh, and to be very deliberate about your mood and the energy you project is a great gift not only to others but to yourself because without that kind of intentionality, you're just pushed and pulled by the circumstances of life or what you just heard on the radio on the news, and that's no way to live. You'll go into a funk if you live passive like that. It's very good to be intentional about your um, energy, your emotionality, the mood you carry, and how you affect those among whom you move. And you'll find all that reflects back to you, that if you give in that way to others, there's a wonderful feedback loop that means that you are uplifted in the experience. And so that's the message that I'd conclude with. Paul, thank you for that message, and thank you for being my guest again. Thanks, Jeff. It's been a pleasure.
Likewise. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.